Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try to make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that hopefully matters to you. Today, we have a very special story and guest that we will be sharing with you. Our guest, Vicki McGregor, will be discussing Williams Syndrome and her son, Stephen, Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, this interview will be conducted by audio only and there will be no video, but we do hope that you find encouragement and support in watching and listening to this story. Thank you so much. Welcome, Vicki, to All Home Care Matters. Welcome. Thank you for being here, Vicki. Thanks, Lance. I'm really glad to, uh, to be here and really thrilled that you've asked me to participate. Absolutely. And I wanted to share your story. Um, you have a son, Stephen, who was diagnosed with Williams syndrome at only 13 months old. And I think you could share a lot of valuable, helpful information and encouragement to families who may be going through similar circumstances as you were. Um, why don't we start with when you first found out that Stephen was diagnosed with Williams syndrome? Sure. Um, when when he was 13 months, as you said, he he was displaying up until that point, he was displaying um, some some weaknesses in his development. He wasn't developing as as quickly and as what we would say normally as his peer group, which I had around me. And they prompted me to ask the doctor about it. And, and we went through the whole process of testing at a large um, Canadian hospital. Um, they were very quick to diagnose him with Williams syndrome, probably within an hour. And with that diagnosis, um, being the times that it was, it was in the 1980s, I didn't have free access to information. So my initial reaction was one of disbelief, um, fear, and inability to find information about Williams syndrome. The doctor that we had at the time was, was a lovely woman and she sent me literally a cardboard box of Xerox copies of medical huh? documents on Williams syndrome. It's a bit overwhelming. And as a young first mom, um, almost uncomprehensible. I, I, was pouring through the, all this information about my son, what he, unfortunately, the way they display this information and relay it to you, they're, they're telling you what your child will not do in more cases than not. So, you know, he will not do this, he will not do that. It'll take too long for this to happen and for that to happen. So Vicki, as a... Just to jump in real quick, as a, as a new mother, I cannot imagine, even as a new father, how it must have been devastating to sit there and, you know, be told everything your child won't be able to do. Did they ever give you any sort of supportive encouragement saying things that possibly they could achieve and accomplish? Or was it all just what they aren't able to do? It was all very negative. Mm. It was all negative. And I think that's what drove me to um, put the, the diagnosis of Williams syndrome aside and then focus on him, Stephen, the child, not Stephen, the child with Williams syndrome. And it was kind of like a mind, you had to have a mind shift that, yes, I'm very recognizing what Williams syndrome is and what the medical problems could be, but that wasn't the focus. The focus still was on the child, his experience, yeah. 
and giving him all the experiences so he'd find his way. And we were finding our way with him. So I literally put that Williams syndrome away. J just quickly, I will mention that at the very beginning, I did source out um, groups of parents with children with Williams syndrome, thinking that that was going to be something that was going to work for me to mm -hmm. be part of that community. I don't mean to diminish people that find comfort and companionship in groups like that, but I found that even more confronting. We went to one meeting and walked into this group, this room full of parents and all their children look like mine. And they and these parents also felt quite comfortable coming up to my child and hugging my child and as if they knew my child, which they didn't. They right. recognized him. Mm -hmm. But and I and, and it may just be me, but I went or I came away from that thinking, well, would you have a, a, a group for children with blonde hair or children who all wore glasses or something like that? And it, it just wasn't for us. I yeah. wanted Stephen to to have to be exposed to life, not life with Williams syndrome. So that's what I did. Um, those early years, and I'm, when I say early years, Lance, I mean before he started school, um, and take into mind that Stephen didn't actually walk on his own till he was three. Um, children with Williams syndrome and my child with Williams syndrome has gross motor issues and fine motor issues. So walking was a struggle. And... Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you a quick story of the first day he walked, if you'd like. Yeah, please do. Stephen, Stephen did walk um, holding on to furniture, as children do. They creep along and hold on to a table and then transfer their hands to another table as they walk around the house. Well, Stephen did that till he was three. But he used to wear this little top. I, I think if you can think of a Star Trek top where they had that little logo on the front of their shirt, well, okay. where that logo was on St Stephen's shirt was a little silver ring. And mm. this particular day, he was wearing that top and he was holding that silver ring. And he let go and walked across the room. Wow. So there was, yeah, there was a sense of security we're holding that ring on his shirt. Well, I can tell you, he wore that shirt a lot for the next week or so <laughs> as, he as he toddled around the house. So those, those early years were probably the easier years in that we knew what he had, knowing what they had. When you don't know, you know there's something wrong with your child or not something not quite right with your child. Once you know what it is, it of course is easier. You know what you're dealing with. Right. When, so when he went to, I enrolled him in a regular preschool, kindergarten type of situation. Mm -hmm. And that was, the, that was the start of him um, going to school for the next 13 years with the same peer group. And what was wonderful about the preschool was that Stephen was actually quite the star. He has no inhibitions and he is a performer. And that first preschool Christmas, he was Santa. He was the one who could remember his lines. He was the one who didn't mind being in front of everybody. He's very gregarious. And that happened as we moved forward into school. Well, and an interesting thing, Vicki, that you had shared with me uh, in one of our discussions, you never let on to Stephen that he had anything different about him than the other kids. He never knew he was diagnosed with Williams syndrome. Uh, when I... Mm. Oh. It goes along with 
deciding that I wanted to focus on the person, Stephen. Yeah. And not I a label. Didn't want him. Not a label. I don't like labels. Uh, I just ever. We're all the same, um, yet different. And I didn't. I also didn't want him to potentially use it as a crutch saying well you know I have Williams syndrome I can't do that and um, so with everything but the world looks at things a little different so when I was enrolling him in swim lessons for example at a very very large facility um, they refused to take him and that's like a red rag to a bull for me because I said, well, why aren't you taking him? And the, the answer came back, well, he has Williams syndrome. We can't teach kids with Williams syndrome to swim. And I thought, well, that's a bit strange. <laughs> yeah. How many kids had they tried teaching before? Um, I think it would be hard to... I can't remember really how many they actually had taught before Stephen. I find it hard to imagine that it would be many because there is some school of thought that believes it's the birth is one in 20,000 or one in 250,000. So there couldn't be that many. Um, but I pushed on it, Lance, I pushed on mm. it hard and they took him on board and they taught him to swim. Oh, that's wonderful. So what, what they learned from that was, yeah, kids with Williams syndrome can be taught to swim. And that was good for the next kid that was going to come along. I, I just wanted, and it was also the same with soccer. Okay. Um, but by the time um, I enrolled Stephen in, soccer or football, whatever you want to call it. Um, he had a sister. I had had another child and his sister um, wanted to play soccer desperately at about the age of five, six. And I thought, well, if, if she's going to play, um, well, Stephen is too. So we, again, this is a small town. Everybody knows everybody. Um, everybody's aware that Stephen is a different, a different child. Um, and I, I went and spoke to the fellow who was going to be his coach and lovely fellow owned the local video store. And I said to him, I really want him to play. I understand all parents want their kids to have field time. I said, we just five minutes aside just so he's participating on the field, that would be fantastic. And he said, look, no problem. I'll find a place for him um, in the game. Every time we play, he'll get some field time. And I don't know if you know what soccer parents can be like. They can be pretty brutal. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a soccer parent. <laughs> there you go. So you know there can be those parents that take it very seriously. And I didn't want my child to be yelled at from the sidelines right, by some parent. Anyway, sure. this one yeah. particular this one one particular game. Now you remember I've said it's a small town, everybody knows everybody. And this one particular game, Stephen's on the field, a beautiful, beautiful night in the summer. All the parents in the stands, there was probably 50, 60 parents in the stands. And Everybody's into the game and Stephen's on the field and he's watching a bug. Uh, he's nine, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And he is not paying any attention to the game at all. And he's watching a bug and the ball's coming straight for him. And every parent in the stand is going, kick the ball, kick the ball. And Stephen looks up and he nails that ball. He oh, absolutely wow. nails that ball. And every parent in the stand stood on their feet and cheered. Wow. He didn't go in the net. He just made ball contact. Yeah. And they all stood and cheered. It was just 
one of those things that happens that you realize people are engaged and people do care and people do notice and people get excited. Um, and this, oh, what a great this, moment for him too. It was, well, you know yeah. what, Lance, I think he went back to the bug pretty quick, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was, it was just, and I, and I talked to him about it still today. Um, you know, how fantastic it was for the other parents to see him participating in sport. So, you know, things like riding his bike, he, he's, he rides a bike and, and the, all that information that I got way back at the beginning said he never would. Um, I mean, they even said he'd never go to the toilet on his own, which is, he was never a problem in that area. So there are a lot of things you, you just, you've just got to go with your, with your gut. Let me ask a question. So this, this doctor who really just gave you boxes of index cards as your diagnosis was given and doesn't seem like much more than that. Uh, I got two parts to this question. Did you guys continue seeing that doctor? Uh, quick answer. No. Okay. And did you, cause I can imagine as a parent, I would be very tempted to, and I probably would all these wonderful things that you and Steven are showing that he can do just like any other child. I would be very tempted to send the doctor a letter and just say, you know, I want to make you aware of this. So if you do come across another parent and child who is going to receive this diagnosis, you'll be a little more informed as to what these families can accomplish and do if they want to. I mean, because if you'd have just taken that advice, I mean, it, I shudder to think where that would have led Stephen and even you as a parent, you know, but you didn't let that deter you. And I just think that's remarkable. Well, I went to, uh, what I, I did was, again, small town um, with, a, with a GP and our GP was, followed him all the way through to young adulthood. And he was the one who said, yeah, let's go get him diagnosed. And um, he, he was very good at letting me take the reins. I guess he figured mothers knows best. And no, I never did write this particular doctor um, back in the day. Um, maybe if there was email, I might have. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I didn't. And I guess the focus went on to Stephen. In hindsight, probably should have said something or years later said, look, look what the child has done um, where he has come and um, but I did it and it it is frustrating and probably for some parents they could be very easily um, oh, depressed really and yeah. you know where do you turn and I think that you've got to go with your gut and you just keep turning over rocks and don't take no for an answer the, the doctor side of it is one thing, but it's all the other people that they come into contact with who have a preconceived ideas of what a person is supposed to be able to do or not do. And I'd like to tell you a story about high school and the high school band orchestra. Yeah, please. I was actually going to ask you how it was for him when he was starting school. Primary school, Lance, was, was really quite a, good in that one classroom, one teacher, and he had what's called an IEP, an individual ed education plan. His, his, his schooling was just a li little bit different than everybody else. Um, Stephen is reading beautiful. He speaks English and French. His, his handwriting, of course, he has insult to injury. Not only does he have a small motor skill issues, he's also left-handed. So he has quite this chicken scroll of handwriting, but he can do it. His spelling is amazing. Um, so the, those years were really quite easy because when you have, Stephen has reasoning skill problems. So with one classroom, it, the world is very small and moves in a very small bubble. As soon as he got to high school, 
Well, that's many classrooms moving between classes, um, a lot of distractions along the way, and a lot of people that didn't know him. So in the high, in high school, I suspect, well, I know, but I didn't find out it until later. There was a bit of bullying that went on in high school. Kids get bullied. Yes, I was bullied. Um, but I think for Stephen, because of his nature, it, some of it did roll off his back. But the most interesting thing that came out of high school was Stephen has a natural talent for music. He has perfect pitch. He can listen to something on the radio as movie theme and play it on a recorder. Is, is that part of William syndrome or the fact that his father is a musician? Don't know. I go with the father is the musician. Okay. Um, he, so when he entered school, this particular school had a award-winning high school band, marching band, concert band, jazz band. And I just wanted Stephen to be a part of the music program. And I had to, I went in with a presentation as to why I wanted him to be part of the program and explained where I thought, and here's me parent telling school what to do, um, what I thought he needed to be, where he, what he needed to play, what instrument he needed to play. And I said, he needs to be in the percussion section. And the music teacher went, hmm. And look, he was a lovely guy, this music teacher, but he had an award-winning band. And I honestly believe that he set Stephen up to fail. He put him on the trumpet. Okay. And I, again, said, look, this isn't right. And I went and had a chat with him. And I said, this is a public school. And my child has a right to be in this music program. And he said, okay, fine. He said, my concern is he's going to throw the band off and you know, they're, they're not going to perform well with him in percussion. And I said, well, let's give it a shot. See what happens. Flash forward to a few years later. Probably, and so Stephen is now part of the band. He's playing the big, huge bass drum. Boom, boom, boom. What I like to call the heartbeat of the band. Mm -hmm. And yeah. We went, went to a concert years later, and there's Stephen in the back, and all the parents in the room. I think it was Christmas concert, big gymnasium. And Stephen's up in the back. You can see him under the theater lights. And we're watching him, and he's boom, boom, right on beat. And doesn't he take the baton and put it in his other hand? He doesn't miss a beat. Wow. He just, his hand just got tired, so he switched hands. Never missed a beat. When he graduated from high school, five years after high school and five years in the band, it was a you know, the big um, graduation ceremony with the caps and gowns and everything. And it was beautiful. It was outside. It was a lovely June evening. And they're giving out awards and awards, you know, the chemistry award, the history award, all these kids are getting all these awards. And I'll just call the te the music teacher Mr. D. Mr. D gets up on the stage and he has the award in his hand and he starts to speak and starts to talk about the music program and how it's a wonderful part of the band, part of the school. And that because of one particular student who was graduating that year, he learned more about music from this student than he learned from anybody else in his teaching career. And that that year, the award was going to my son, Stephen. Wow, that is just phenomenal. Did you have any idea, Vicki? I had no idea. I, as he was starting to speak, I was thinking, is he talking about Stephen? And I, I thought, he, he sounds like he's talking to Stephen, at which point, of course, I start to cry a little bit and people are turning around and looking at me because they know that he's talking about Stephen. Yeah. And 
it, it, the words that he used, you know, were he got educated, he didn't see the potential, he was being exclusive and um, not opening up the band to somebody who potentially was going to add something to the band and all and you know as he said all the other kids in the band benefited from Stephen being there so that was one of those moments where you go yeah okay yeah I think maybe I've done the right thing absolutely uh, and you have to remember at this point Stephen still doesn't know he has William syndrome Vicky how so, real quick how now um was Stephen's sister how far apart are they in age? They're four years apart. Okay. Were they ever in high school at the same time when Stephen was a they senior? They were. Okay. Yeah. Now, was she they aware? Was a... Yeah. She wasn't aware of the Williams syndrome, but she was definitely aware that her brother was following a different education path. He didn't okay. have to do some of the work that she was doing. Um, her friends... And it was interesting. My daughter was a very popular girl in high school, um, exceptionally popular. And so all her cohort that were four years younger than Stephen also became Stephen's bodyguards. Nice. Okay. And he had many, many bodyguards. And um, she, she remains to this day um, his main point of contact for, for any issues that might pop up okay um it it i think for her what and and possibly for other parents and uh, something that i didn't really understand or appreciate until years later didn't really notice it happening at the time but on reflection hindsight um it was very it's very obvious to me with only the two children, the firstborn being the one with uh, special abilities, this second child sometimes can get lost in the limelight on the first child. Right. So by that, I mean that a lot of people would, I'd be there with my two kids and hi, Stephen, how are you? Or how, what are you doing, Stephen? And forget that there's this little girl there who is also relevant and important and not ask what she's doing. I think she got a bit, she's, she's, she's one of two children, but in essence, an only child. If that makes any sense. That, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I think that that, that's a trap. that's very easy to fall into is to forget that she is relevant. She's just not Stephen's little sister. She was just as, important uh and she was we you know she wasn't ignored or in any way shape or form um but i think in 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 general they get lost a little bit and um i'm not an only child i don't know what it would be like to be an only child and i do know not do don't know what it would be like to be the only sibling of a child with special abilities uh so right. the the pressure on her i would imagine was quite great mm -hmm um so also you know something that i think that um siblings as well as siblings with experience um could also bring something to the table for for parents um who are struggling or are curious about how things roll out um adult siblings of, of kids that have grown up with special abilities would definitely have something to offer um, as far as advice would go. When Stephen left high school, we enrolled him in a program at a large Quebec university that was, it was only for people with special abilities okay. of anything. Um, and that's the point that I had to tell Stephen he had Williams syndrome. If you can walk us through that on that day when you woke up and you knew after, I would say, what, 18, 19 years, um, 17, 17 th years, yeah. 17, 17 years. Um, that was the day you were going to sit down and talk to Stephen and tell him this. 
kind of walk us through what that was like. I can't imagine. I don't. I don't know how that would feel. Or uh, were you concerned about how he may respond? Or I was. I was very concerned about it. Um, and at at that point in time, um, I was now a single mom. So it was. It was down to me. And if I took Stephen for a walk. I decided at that point I was a single mom and I decided I, I just needed to, to let him know. So I took him for a walk. It was a summer evening and I attempted to explain to him that I had something to tell him about himself that I hadn't told him because I didn't think it would have benefited him through school. And for the reasons I've already mentioned are the things I said to him. I didn't want him to use it as a crutch. I didn't want him to have a label. Um, I wanted him to be Stephen. And that's who he was. He developed into this really fine young man. And then I told him that he had William syndrome. And that was the reason why he didn't look like me and he didn't look like his sister or his dad. Um, why he had troubles with pens. I just went through the whole thing about William syndrome and he was very angry with me yeah. uh, um, for, for not telling him. Very, very angry. And I understood that. I was upset, swallowed my, my emotions a bit in that I didn't want him I wanted him to know that the decision I may, had made was the right decision. I didn't want to say, and I didn't. I never said I was sorry for not telling him because I wasn't. I believed it was the right thing to do, and I still do today. Not necessarily for everybody, but for him and for me and for his sister, it was the right thing to do. It didn't take long, though, for him to going to this particular program that he was going into, he was going to see that everybody there was different and had struggles and abilities in different ways. And I didn't want him to question, what am I doing here? Okay. Yeah. So he, once he was there, it then became, he was with kids who had Down syndrome. He was there with kids who had different kinds of birth result defects. Um, there was a couple of kids um, who had quite pronounced physical disabilities because of cerebral palsy. And at that point, he had Williams talk about that and say, well, I have Williams syndrome. And now we're in the internet age and he looked it up. And he started to do his own research into Williams syndrome. And as, an, as a young adult, now he owned it. It's not something I gave to him. He actually now owned it. He was in, at an, a place intellectually and emotionally that he could actually understand it and take it in what kind of responses did you get to him once he went and did his own investigating and researching about Williams syndrome did he come back and say oh well now that makes sense about maybe something that happened to him or did did it make more sense to him once he understood it he, he, he definitely connected the dots he's what the information that he was reading um, and there were there are many Williams syndrome sites um, and many Williams syndrome groups across North America. They are here in Australia as well. Um, oh, just prompted another little thing I wanted to tell you. Um, he 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 found I think some comfort and almost like a team type of thing in that this is where I fit now that I'm not in school anymore and not playing in the sandbox and all these things with other little kids. I'm an adult and this is mine. 
this is who I am and this is mm -hmm. this is why I am who I am. He doesn't talk about it as much anymore. Um, and this is 15, 16 years later. He doesn't fall back on the Williams syndrome thing. When he, there was a moment when he moved out of home and into a, um, a facility that was a house with other kids with the special abilities. And he met a girl. He, he, what he said to me on the phone was his mom, I met somebody that looks just like me. And he's friends with her today. Her name's Wendy. She has Williams syndrome. She's married. Um, and they're wow. still close today. Wonderful. Uh, it is. It's a wonderful story. Her and her husband are the sweetest kids. Um, and they live independently and they have a dog and everything. Um, and I, her parents were a bit like me in that it wasn't about the Williams syndrome. It was about the person. Right. And um, but when Stephen met her, it was it was almost validated that, look, there's somebody that's just like me. I'm not different. There's someone they, somebody like me. So there you've got the full circle, right? You've got me wanting him to be like everybody else. And then as he grows up, he finds comfort in that he is just like somebody else. That's wonderful. How old is Steven today? He's 37. 37. Okay. Now he lives in Canada where in you had moved to Australia, correct? Correct. Correct. Tell me about his first trip. His first trip to Australia. His to first Australia. trip to, yeah, that was um, in 2010. No, oh, sorry, 2009. And I um, booked him a flight with major Canadian airline through, I think now through Vancouver onto Sydney. And then I flew from my home in Queensland down to Sydney. I am sure that this airline had my photo in their file because I spoke to them so many times okay. about Stephen. Well, it was his first. It was his first trip by himself, right? It was his first trip by himself. He, they were wonderful. The airline were wonderful. He was an adult, um, and he's he he. So he didn't qualify for any kind of special care, um, but they cared for him anyway. He got the tag around his neck and everything. Um, and it is a long flight from Vancouver to Sydney. It's over 13 hours. I think it's 14 and a half hours. Yeah. Um, and Stephen is, <clears throat> Stephen is a talker. I wonder where he gets it from, but Stephen is a talker. And he will talk to anyone. And that is one of the things with, that's a bit scary with Williams syndrome is they talk to anyone and everyone. So my concern was that the poor people that were going to be sitting next to him for 14 hours were going to get an earful the whole entire way. And I flew down to Sydney to get him and I'm waiting for him to come out. I don't know if you've ever seen the opening scene of that movie Love Actually where all these people are running through the airport and hugging and kissing. Oh yeah. I, I was not going to be one of those people. Oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to lose it. No way. I'm going to be cool, cool, cool. Of course, as soon as I see him coming through, I'm under the ropes. I'm barreling down the where you're not supposed to go and hugging him and tears, the whole thing. Dry myself off. We're starting to walk away through the airport. And oh, I haven't seen him for over a year. And I'm just relieved that he's in one piece. And this woman comes up behind me and taps me on the shoulder. And she said, are you Vicky? I went, oh no, what did he do? <laughs> what did he do? And she said, I said, yes, I am. And she said, I just wanted you to know my husband and I were sitting next to your son from Vancouver. And again, in my head, I'm thinking, oh no, here it comes. She said, 
you have such a beautiful son. It was an absolute pleasure to be sitting next to him for that journey. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, and it was just, it was one of those little moments and, and for Stephen too. Um, but I was so proud. I was so proud of him. Um, one, that he arrived safe and sound and, and, and two, that these people enjoyed my son. Yeah. And that, and that was his first trip. The, the second trip, he flew right into Brisbane. It was a breeze. He was a veteran. He knew about flying and what to expect. And um, that one was a breeze. And he's also flew to Europe one year when we were over there for a few months. And um, the flight from Montreal to Paris is, it's nothing. It's only eight hours. And he was supposed to get um, care, uh, uh, someone to take him from the plane out into immigration. Well, somehow that didn't happen. Mm. And I was waiting and waiting and waiting. Everybody from his plane had already come out and no Stephen. And I'm really starting to worry now. Um, and lo and behold, out he comes. He's got his backpack over. He's dragging his coat. He's looking exhausted. And I said, what happened? And he said, oh, I don't know. But the person wasn't there. He said, but I made it through, Mom. I just read the signs and asked a few people remember that he speaks French and out he came all on his own with no assistance at all. He looked a bit shattered and a bit tired. Oh, anybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. But he was perfectly fine. Um, having said that, I wasn't happy. That's what the airline was supposed to do. Um, large Canadian airline. And, and I got on the phone with them and didn't they give him a free trip to Toronto? <laughs> okay. For their little mess up but look he he's he's brilliant he is um able to to work within the services that are available he he has learned and this was really important too when i when i talk about i wanted him not to know who he was i wanted him to be stephen right it was important that it is so important that he be independent and able to ask for help, know where to go for help, who to trust, who not to trust, um, to gauge the good and the bad. And the mm -hmm. only way that he's going to know that is if he does it on his own. Right. And with support from both his parents, his sister, the services around him, He's got to know that I'm not always going to be around and I can pull a few strings here and there when need be, but I need him to make those decisions for himself. It, you know, a lot of the conversations we have now are about what do you think you should do? What is the right thing to do? How do you feel about that situation? Are you uncomfortable? And or who do you think you can talk to about it? And he's able now to go and source those services that are available to him. And you know, yeah. And you know, Vicki, I would just say Williams syndrome or not, I think you're doing exactly what most any other parent would do for their child, you know, teaching them how to be independent, who to trust, where to go for help, regardless of, you know, a diagnosis or not, we all want our kids to have that. And I just want to say, you know, Stephen is, I've never met him, but I know him through you. He's a remarkable young man. I mean, he speaks more languages than most people do. He's been to more countries than most people have. I mean, you know, what a, what a tremendous, tremendous young man. I mean, even going all the way back to, you know, you talking to that, you know, uh, soccer coach, you know, and, you know, Steven kicked the ball, right. And made good contact. I mean, just a remarkable, remarkable life he's living. And I just, I, I think you're to be commended, but he's also to be commended for achieving what he's done is just remarkable. So many people would, like you said early on, so many people would have used that diagnosis 
as a crutch just to get by, you know, and I've often in my head, we've talked about this before. I've gone back and forth now being a parent, but then also have having, we're all a child at some point. What would I have done if I was a child and my parents kept that diagnosis from me? And what would I have done if one of my children had been given a diagnosis? And, you know, I think I would have done the same exact thing. You know, you don't want labels are, are powerful on some people where, you know, once you label somebody, they, they stick with that label, you know, and it, it, it kind of can prevent them from achieving and doing to their greatest potential. You know, I mean, even going back to that original doctor who says he, you know, it was all the things they can't do versus the things that he could potentially do, you know, and if you would have stuck with that, you know, would Steven speak multiple languages? Would Steven have played soccer? Would he, you know, played and uh, won the award for band? I mean, all of these remarkable things that most people who don't have any diagnosis won't ever be able to say. And look at what he's done. I just think it's tremendous. It is. He, he, and I agree 100%. And I know that, you know, parenting is a very individual thing. Um, but you're right. We all want the best for our kids. When he came here the second time in 2017, he was here for my birthday. He gave the most beautiful speech at the table. There's 25 of us. But the other thing he did was he jumped out of an airplane. Oh my. And now I was going to do it with him. I did it in 2013. And um, I didn't do it because I had had a surgery that my surgeon said, no, you're not jumping out of an airplane. So my partner went with him. And there was this moment right up, we said to him, right up until you get into the plane, you can say no. Once you're in the plane, the only way out of the plane is through the rear door. Um, but he was, uh, when he, when he landed and he landed on his feet, the, the look of joy on his face, because this is, that's what people do. People take yeah. risk and people take chances. And, and he left, he left out of an airplane. And I, I take that as sort of the, the, the peak of what you can do, no matter who you are. Yes. And, and he, he takes risks, Stephen, not me. I mean, he didn't jump without a parachute and another person strapped to him. Um, you take risks with, with knowing, knowing what they are. And, and, and he's, he was so proud of himself. Um, you walk on cloud nine when you leave an airplane. And um, it, it was a wonderful experience for him. And after he said that, he said, Mom, I can do anything now. Good I can him. do anything. Yeah. Yeah. That was brilliant. That, that is remarkable. Absolutely. Vicki, uh, just a couple of things before we go here. Um, first, I just want to offer a heartfelt thank you for, you know, sharing you and Stephen's story. I know sometimes, you know, some of these stories about our families and things we've gone through can be, can be very difficult to share. And I just know that there are families that will get a lot of inspiration and encouragement from you sharing Stephen's story. So I do appreciate that. And I also want to just touch on something I thought was really a great idea. Um, our friend uh, Barbara, I think, had shared this, and then I had read your uh, article at Victoria's Press about it. And we'll have links to your blog and things in the show notes and on our website. But uh, you and Stephen play a game where you have your pictures through Ponga, which Ponga is a fascinating platform for, for families with photos or historical images. And you guys play a game. Why don't you describe the game that you guys play using Ponga? Yeah, we play this little game, com uh, Comments in Ponga. So with, with Ponga, um, it's facial recognition software in photographs. And I've created this, this album for Stephen of, of his photographs. And um, what we do is we share this. He gets on, he's my guest, and he, get, he accepts Ponga from, from Canada. And he'll choose a photo in the album and he'll write in a comment about the photo. And then we both refresh our browsers and I can see his comment. And 
then I will make a comment back either on that photo or another photo. And it it has somehow flushed out a bit of a dialogue about a couple of things. And I found it really precious because he said something to me in one of his comments about when I first moved away from Canada to Australia, how upset he was because the photo was the final photo I took of him in 2005 when I moved. And he and I said, I loved the photo. And he said, well, I was really upset that day. So I responded back and said, I can understand how you are upset. And it was a big, important day. But sharing that image through Ponga opened up this dialogue of a memory from that day. Um, and it's a fun game. We and even there's even there was a picture of the alligator on our dining room floor when he turned 13 and we had the reptile man come. So there was also that dialogue. So it really opened up a conversation and it's a really fun little game to play. It's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely blast. And, and we do it almost every time now when we talk. Now, what would you, what would be your parting advice or words of encouragement for families who may be going through similar situations with, with their, their children? children? Oh, goodness. Uh, look, a, a couple of things. One, the labels I don't like. So try not to label your child. I like the term special abilities. We all have them. And don't take no for an answer. Um, keep going and let, let people know that, you know, your child is a child just like the rest of them. And if there's something you want your child to be a part of, and there is no danger to your child to be part of it, or to anybody else, push for it, push hard. And and people are pretty, pretty open once they understand. Look, well, Lance, I just, I wanted to, I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to just quickly to yeah. thank you for this. I Absolutely. haven't spoken about my son. Yeah, I haven't spoken about Stephen in this way for a very long time. Um, and I'd also like to put it out that, you know, if anybody um, wanted to contact me directly, they please do that um, if they want to get, the details from from you that would be fine um okay. i'm happy to talk, talk to anybody or, or email at any time okay well we'll include uh your website in the show notes and i'll also Excellent. i'll also make sure that they put your email and address in there vicky it's, it's our pleasure i told you this i felt like was such an important topic and discussion to have because i know as i'm sure you can understand there are probably a lot of families out there who are just starting to go through this and they're not sure what to do or how to approach it. And I just think you and Steven are such an inspiration. Um, I, I just cannot say how remarkable I find both of you. And it's been a, a true honor and privilege of ours to be able to sit down and talk with you today about it. Oh, th thanks. Thanks so much, Lance. I really appreciate Ab it. That's been absolutely. wonderful. Thank you for joining us today at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here for you and to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We also want to give a special thank you to Vicki again for sharing her story of Stephen and Williams Syndrome. Remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. And please, if you know someone who could benefit from this episode, please make sure and share it with them. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions, every form is read and responded to. We look forward to seeing you next time on All Home Care Matters. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.